Hello and welcome to Driven by Doing. Today we have Ryan Pierce. Ryan, welcome to the show Driven by Doing. Uh, so glad to be here, Benki. Thank you so much. So Ryan, uh, I have been seeing you for the past couple of years at least uh, at the Crew Center for Entrepreneurship here at the University of Memphis. And now you are in the senior year for economics and political science major. And <laughs> so you have got one more year to go. Super excited uh, for that. And on top of it, you are doing some amazing things. And uh, you have an amazing story. And I definitely want to deep dive and really unveil so that all our listeners can actually get a lot of inspiration uh, from your story. Yeah, so and uh, <laughs> so, so where did it began for you? Like I, you just told me that like you are originally from San Diego, California. Let's go back to San Diego, a few years back, and let's let's share your story. So thank you so much. And first off, I would like to say thank you again for being here. And I'm glad we're taking it back to San Diego. It's <laughs> you and far in between that I get a chance to go back to the original location. So we can start right there. Uh, so yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Pierce. I was born in San Diego, California. Um, to uh, a great mother and father that had a great relationship. Um, I have a brother and a half and two half sisters, one in Chicago, Illinois, and the other one also in San Diego, California. Um, grew up just a very, um, I'm not gonna say mischievous. I'm not gonna say mischievous. I, I grew up a very um, energetic kid. I grew up a very much a real energetic kid. Always loved making people laugh. Always loved uh, connecting with other people. Um, one of my earliest memories, actually, in, in preschool and in kindergarten, um, I was always kind of an outcast, uh, which was interesting in my early years. Um, this may sound really weird, but I remember in that time that playing with toys, even though we were like five, six, seven, eight years old, wasn't the cool thing to do. And I always would carry toys around with me, and I'd always want to play with them at recess and stuff like that. And I would always get picked on for it. Um, at that age. And, um, you know, when things transitioned into my early years in elementary school, I started, you know, taking up the, the position of a class clown and a jokester and things like that. I started building more friends. And in, in that process, I always remember what it felt like to be an outcast in those early years. And I, in, in that, around that time, I truly began to develop a true sense of empathy. And that's when I learned that we all have a responsibility to use our positioning and our, our status and um, our blessings to help other people, you know? So even though I was the quote unquote cool kid, I uh, wanted to help out those who kind of felt like I did a couple of years prior. Um, so I use that as the foundation because it's gonna play a key role as I you know, un unveil this story. Uh, so from San Diego, California, uh, in 2008, at the mark of the recession, my mom's job, she works at, for specialty care, um, a healthcare company. Um, they ended up closing up her, her location in San Diego, California, when the recession hit. Um, you know, there was thousands of layoffs amongst the company and millions across the nation. And my family, just like many others, had to adjust and do what we could to stay alive. Uh, my parents, unfortunately, got a divorce about a year prior, and my mother was just trying to do her best to uh, you know, make sure that my brother and I were okay, of course, with the love of my father, uh, but we were under her wing and we had to move up all of our stuff to uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, we ended up living in Murfreesboro and there I, um, taking those same ideals, uh, transitioned to um, school out there. And man, I actually really loved Tennessee as soon as I got here. I did. Uh, I liked the Southern twang that people had. Uh, I liked, it was just different. It was very different. Now, granted, San Diego was incredibly diverse. So it was different to come to Tennessee and just mainly be around uh, pr predominantly black and white people. I'm so much, I was raised in an environment that was a lot more uh, culturally and ethnically diverse than that. But upon getting to Tennessee, man, I really liked it. You know, I, I got back into class clowning and things like that. Um, you know, trying to, you know, make friends, build relationships. And I was having a great time. Um, I ended up around fifth grade doing uh, Cub Scouts, which later turned into Boy Scouts. And it was through that organization that uh, I think I really began to develop a true sense of who I am as an individual. Um, hearkening back to that previous story that I told you, um, you know, the tenets of, you know, Boy Scouts to be uh, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Scouts honor, I remember to this day. Uh, I <laughs> believe that very much in my soul. And uh, in, you know, joining the Boy Scouts at around 11 years old, I was also thrust inside of an environment where uh, I was around different 
different individuals uh, that were totally different from me. A lot of these kids were uh, from more rural backgrounds, um, from you know different walks of life. But through Boy Scouts, I was able to um, meet new people and also better understand um, that really as individuals, we, all, we have a lot more in common. Uh, in Boy Scouts, I did a whole lot of work with uh, first aid, did a lot of work with um, you know, swimming and uh, public speaking and leading. Um, I took my first leadership position at around 12 years old, uh, or 13 rather, I became the senior patrol leader, which is like the president, so to speak, of our Boy Scout organization. Uh, our group was about 100 boys strong at the time, and I was responsible for making sure everyone was doing what they were supposed to be doing. And it was a great experience for me, and I think it laid a foundation to entrepreneurship where I, I now am today, in the sense that I had to manage different personalities, uh, keep the collective group's best interest at heart, uh, and, and also take that sense of empathy to, that I learned you know, in years prior to the job. Um, I began to truly public speak and become a lot more comfortable inside of my skin. Um, and yeah, you know, it was, it was a great experience, but also through Boy Scouts, I learned the importance of service. And I can't, I can't help but say it again, hearkening back to that initial foundation that I, that I laid before, because it's so pivotal to where I am today. Um, I learned the beauty in being able to serve, you know, and be your brother's keeper and use what you have to help the, the man, you know, right next to you. Um, I, we did multiple service projects from building cemeteries to doing, uh, I was on a great project that took a, a piece of the Twin Towers after 9-11 and built, we built a memorial out in Nashville, Tennessee, which is one of the most impactful things I feel like I've ever been a part of. And uh, that, I took that with me everywhere that I went. Um, so, you know, yeah, that was, that was coming to Tennessee. That was Boy Scouts uh, leading the group. I became an Eagle Scout at 15 years old. And uh, that means the whole world to me. Uh, that means that I, I took an, I swore an oath to do what I could to be a great steward, uh, to be a, an honorable citizen, and to use what I have um, to stand up for what's right. That's you know. just uh, awesome, Ryan. Like you shared a lot of great stuff there, and uh, let's break it down now. And sure. you, you, yeah. took, you took <laughs> yeah. you took a leadership roles at such an early age, right? So one of the things, if I look back uh, at my school days. And I remember uh, I took a lot of leadership roles as well. And in fact, uh, there is this uh, funny incident that happened while I was in school. And uh, uh, the teacher asked like, hey, who wants to be uh, the leader of the class? And uh, none of my classmates actually responded. And he said, he said, if you are not responding in a minute, I'm going to write the role number or the student number that is going to be the leader. And uh, it happened to it happened to be so that he just wrote my number. I I didn't realize like like why did this guy write, wrote my number and and I took that opportunity not knowing like you know really uh, how to do it and like you know really uh, learn from it. And yeah. I think even from from my own childhood, like I remember like I and then that incident like really helped me to 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 understand the real value of being a leader at a, at a certain early age. And, uh, and on top of it, again, you're the, uh, the eldest, I believe, uh, in your family. I'm is the youngest. Actually. Oh, you're the youngest. Okay, the youngest. so I happen to be the, uh, the oldest in my, like, and I have a sister. And I think, like, these factors sometimes played a role uh, in, in the upbringing because taking these leadership roles, being the, the oldest uh, in, the, in the family, sometimes you you have this natural, uh, I, I, maybe, like, you know, it's, it's a natural gift to you so that because you have to lead the other people uh, in the family or, like, you know, if you have uh, a brother or a sister. And I see the same thing for you happening as well, where you took those early leadership um, activities to develop those skills. And I see that impacting your career so far as well. And one of the biggest things that I love about you is, is your passion and energy. And a uh, lot of times, I mean, you're a student entrepreneur going to college, trying to build a company, trying to lead these student organizations uh, at Crew Center for Entrepreneurship here at the University of Memphis. And there's a lot of great stuff that you're doing. And do you think like taking those early leadership roles have helped you uh, to, to shape what you are today? One one thousand um, percent. You know, you, you touched on it. You know, before even expressing your story, 
Um, it's those early moments that we have in our childhood that can really lay a foundation for good or for bad for who we are and who we who we later on become. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, from the my roles in Boy Scouts to just the the numerous people that I that was able to meet from different walk, walks of lives and uh, different backgrounds, it's definitely had an impact on where I am today. Hmm. Wow. And then you, you came to Memphis for going to college, right? So yes. how did that happen? <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, after my early childhood worked in Boy Scouts, I was the president of my uh, business club out there too. So I took on a later leadership role and I got early experience with pitching. I ended up uh, applying to the University of Memphis and I moved down here. And um, when I got on campus, believe it or not, I really wanted to get involved in the political realm. Hmm very, very interested in understanding the intersection uh, between legislation and commerce and uh, how legislation and policy can create the conditions that we live within as you know, United States citizens. That was really important to me. So when I got to campus, uh, I immediately started working with um, you know, the College Democrats on campus. I uh, did a lot of work with the College Republicans as well and worked on numerous political campaigns. I learned so much about getting out of your comfort zone uh, knocking on people's doors and letting them know about their state representative or what have you. Um, also doing community service and working to uh, you know pick up trash in lower income areas, working with kids and things like that. Uh, but when I was working on campaigns, I found that per particularly when it pertained to um, progressive candidates in the South, a lot of the times they were out financed and they were out resourced. And in creating a level playing field, it didn't really feel right to me that, um, you know, I could, many people would focus so much time and energy, belief and attention in a candidate. And from the jump, they didn't really have the foundations to have an equal fight. That just didn't feel right to me. And in wanting to work in the political realm and having political aspirations myself at that time, I knew that if I wanted to truly do the best for the people and speak truth to power, I couldn't be beholden to donors. I couldn't be worried about financing. I just had to be worried about speaking the truth. And in order to do that, you need freedom. And I felt that, that came from having a stable financial foundation and a strong network. And adding those dots together, uh, that equated to entrepreneurship. <laughs> and that, uh, that's where I ended up coming to the Crew Center for Entrepreneurship. Um, you know, I did that my, my, my freshman year, excuse me. And I ended up applying for an incredible program that's housed here out of the Crew Center a life-changing program uh, called Imagine You. It's, it was a 12-week immersive entrepreneurial program that taught the essential tenets of entrepreneurship from design thinking to uh, customer validation through customer discovery to a variety of different professional and personal uh, development aspects as well. Um, I end up going into the program, pitching an idea for a beautification company, uh, a beautification organization, right? And what I mean by that is the initial idea for Compass, the, the company that I'm still working on and later on developed, uh, we were going to go into lower income areas and simply clean it up, do what we could to increase the property value. And as a result, in the hopes to increase property value, increase funding to public schools and lower income areas. Um, I'm so sorry, Vicky. I apologize. Uh, so in, in increasing the property value through beautification efforts, we hope to uh, increase funding to public schools as a result, bring families back to habitated or under-resourced neighborhoods and create job opportunity. But in a, I'll wrap this up soon. Um, we later found that wasn't a sustainable business model and we pivoted to an idea where we, would, we were uh, transporting <laughs> HVAC parts and materials to technicians that would forget tools in the field via a application, an on-demand platform. Um, that, was a, that was a platform that took uh, that we got a lot of great feedback on. Uh, our our uh, data was validated when we did customer discovery, and we ended up, uh, you know, developing that into a, a really good project that I, I learned a whole lot from. So that's that's kind of what happened. Uh, in wow. the early so there again, you you took that the political uh, scenarios, and then you connected those doors, and it's it's really entrepreneurship. To, yeah. to learn those skills that are going to like, you know, help you in your career. And in fact, entrepreneurship is not just about building any company for you. It's, it's more than that, right? Yeah. So what, does, you know, what are those, yeah. I mean, my whole drive, my mission, my purpose is to create and bring opportunities to under-resourced neighborhoods and communities, be it urban and rural. And uh, 
through my time in Murfreesboro, through my time in San Diego, through my time even in Memphis, I've come across so many talented and um, you know very incredible people, right? That just didn't have the same opportunities that others had or that I had, simply because of where their address was, and that didn't sit right with me. You know, um, I look to the political realm to be the the saving grace for that, but through my time working in the realm, I found that legislation is a part of it but a lot of it is free market solutions and innovative thinking that comes through entrepreneurship. Hence why I'm a political science and econ major. Hence why I am still active in the political realm and working on startups today. That is my mission and that's my goal. And Compass has been a stepping stone in allowing me to understand what that equation looks like to create better opportunity for those who don't have the same opportunities that I've had. Yeah, I mean, you just mentioned your why, the purpose behind why you're doing things that that you care about. And I think a lot of times it just takes that, like, you know, the strong why, because that's what is the driving force behind everything that you're doing on a daily basis. And once you, once we know that is when the true impact is going to be unleashed uh, from our true potential. And I think it's just amazing that you're so early in your career and you're just in college trying to find out and creating these great solutions. And on top of it, it's, it's your strong why to be able to give those kind of opportunities for underprivileged communities. And, and you're talking about the equity, right? So that's exactly what's driving you. Uh, and in fact, like, you know, the product that I'm creating, it's, it's again, the social entrepreneurship to, to really help communities, because I believe that yes, talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. Exactly. Right? What are the solutions that we are creating? It's, it's more towards helping these kids, helping this, students helping these professionals to get those resources or the connections uh, to really leverage uh, the existing resources and especially with technology and everything that we have right now we we can create solutions that brings that equity uh, and especially with everything that is going on in the world everything has become a virtual world in the ra- recent past and looking at everything that is going on into the future I think now is the time to like really leverage our resources to be able to like make it even a leveling field for everybody who's striving hard to make a difference. So in your journey so far, trying to build a startup, trying to, now you also have this responsibility of helping other entrepreneurs at Crew (laughs) Center. And now you are entrepreneur in resident, helping other students in the Imagine You program. What was that experience like to really mentor other entrepreneurs? Because You're learning and on top of it, you're helping other entrepreneurs, which is super cool to help them learn about these these tenets of entrepreneurship and what lessons did you learn? Because I believe in a mentor and mentor relationship, the learning is a two-way process. Agree. So what did you learn from last couple of years that I've been seeing uh, working with students, working at Cruise Center that really is, is making the difference for you? It's a great question. What comes to mind is in my time working with students and alumni, you know, on their startup ideas, there is a strong emotional, spiritual, and psychological component to developing a startup successfully that truly isn't accounted for in most teaching, in most books, and in most, um, you know, resources that are out there for startups. Um, coming in day to day, hearing how people, you know, would deal with trying to do customer discovery, dealing with people's issues when it comes to, oh man, like my, my product, uh, it didn't work, it's malfunctioning, or we're not able to raise capital and funding. The majority of my job really in supporting entrepreneurs, it's about 40% business work and about 60% emotional uh, support <laughs> and development. Um, I found that even through my journey working with Compass, uh, that being an entrepreneur can be a very lonely lifestyle. It really can be. It's seldom that anyone within our families or our friend groups truly understands what it is that we're fighting for and trying to accomplish on a day to day. It's very difficult. And despite the love that they have for us, they do the best that they can. They really don't understand unless they're inside of those, our shoes. So in working with students and in understanding the psychological and emotional issues they were dealing with, that I also dealt with in trying to develop my startup, that's where community building became my primary focus. 
in creating an atmosphere in which individuals that are dealing with the same things can come together, collaborate, and have another sense of family outside of their original family. Um, that's, that's been my biggest takeaway above all else, that you need people that are going through the same things as you in order for you to get through those things. And uh, it's through community building that I find that successful entrepreneurs can be bred and that true bonds and lasting bonds can be established. That's just amazing uh, that you mentioned uh, about like how this entrepreneurship is not, it's, it's a long game, right? And in fact, entrepreneurship is not just about building companies, but it is like, you no. Know, every time I talk with Mike, uh, the director at Crew Center, he tells like, here is what we are helping students with. It's not just about you know, building your business model or doing your customer discovery. It is helping you to create that mindset because entrepreneurship is all about that, taking that pain, right? It is because now going through that process for the last two, two and a half years, three years, especially what I'm starting to realize is, hey, you know what? This is, this is really about the mindset. It's the gold mines are everywhere. The gold mines are nothing but the challenges, Yeah. right? Trying to identify what you resonate deeply with and identifying what you care about how you can solve that problem and sticking with it. And you're right that it is going to be super lonely because if you're not too deeply care, too deeply caring about that particular problem, because most of the times, I mean, I heard hundreds of entrepreneurial stories on podcasts, interviews, YouTube. And I think if you look at any of those entrepreneurs and being a successful entrepreneur, it's that deep insight or the deep pain that we ourselves felt that we get obsessed and we think about that all the time. That's what makes them really successful because they don't care at the end of the day. It's like failure is not in their dictionary. Yeah. It's like they yeah. will keep on going until they solve it, no matter what, period. Right? So I think that's just amazing that how we can just see that common trend across all the entrepreneurs. And it's just like you are learning as a student and especially helping all these other students is also helping you become a great leader. In fact, like you have got those uh, leadership capabilities that you, I see it in you every single time I interact with you, that you are supercharged helping these entrepreneurs. And what would you tell people who are listening and who have these great ideas and challenges that they wanted to solve for the, for the entire world. Like how can they get started? Because sometimes it is overwhelming. Yes, they feel lonely and getting started is one of the major challenges uh, as well. So what would you tell people who are having these ideas, wanting to solve it, but they might feel that, hey, like I'm only a one person. Do you think creating a startup, it has to be done creating the teams and what would you tell an early stage entrepreneur? Well, one saying that we ascribe to here at the crew center is why not now? You know, there's no use in putting it off another minute, another hour or another day. I will say this because that's, that's a very loaded question. And I don't mean that in a negative way because uh, it's a, it's a difficult one in, in the sense because um, it can be very difficult to start. It can be very difficult to start, but what I will say is being led by your passions. Don't worry about having the right circumstances because it's really never gonna come if you worry about that. I think the key is to be led by your passions and to get started and start cre creating a solution that solves a true problem and to focus laser in on accomplishing that. And through that, the rest truly comes. I mean, you hear the word serendipitous a lot or serendipity a lot in entrepreneurship simply having being at the right place at the right time and having the right level of preparation to capitalize on a moment that's the majority of the game you know and that's why the mindset is so key and so important because you never know what's around the corner you never truly know what's around the corner even taking the covid 19 pandemic for example like there have been many startups that have really boomed as a result of this pandemic and are creating solutions that are aiding people going through this pandemic because they didn't quit they focused in on solving their problem and they waited for the right time. And, you know, in something as difficult as the pandemic, they found that it was the right time for their startup to succeed. So in closing, I would say, be led by your passions. 
have the right mindset, be focused on solving that problem, and literally the rest will come. Truly the rest will come. But also, leverage as many programs and resources as you can, because they really are out there. They are out there. But if you're not led by passion, if you don't obsess over solving that problem to make this world a better place for other people, you're not going to have the energy, the foresight, uh, or the drive to truly seek those opportunities, those connections, that network, that team, that capital, the execution needed to accomplish it if, it is, if you don't have that passion. And it all starts up here and is driven by what's in here. So yeah, be led by that and uh, keep on smiling when you can. You're gonna great, need- uh, great insight there, uh, Ryan, because you talked about, uh, touched upon uh, the obsession of like solving that problem. And in fact, very recently I found that, hey, I have an obsession for like you know, really solving my problem, that's what actually driving me every day because I couldn't stop thinking about it and I couldn't sleep until I solved that properly, right? So I think uh, there is a difference, a lot of difference between passion and obsession as well. And I think I just recently heard a podcast, an entrepreneur saying, you need to be really obsessed with that problem to become a great entrepreneur because if you just have the passion to solve it, you might give up at some point. But if you're obsessed with it, it is very, very hard to give it, give, uh, give away. Uh, I think uh, that's, a, that's a great insight. And a uh, lot of entrepreneurs, now once they get started with their idea, and you also talked about a community, and we are seeing a lot of great resources around us that we can leverage in order to build a successful companies. What do you think people can leverage who are thinking about ideas and having ideas to really build companies? What are those resources that they can start leveraging? So glad you asked. For anyone who's looking to start up a company but doesn't really know where to go, there are numerous entrepreneurship centers that are there to provide programming, provide mentorship, uh, connect you with a variety of different individuals that can help you. Uh, get your product and get your idea off of off the ground and even out of your head. I would recommend going to an entrepreneurship center, you know, for most of those people or leveraging an entry level program like the like Light Memphis, for example, that focuses on teaching high school students uh, entrepreneurship, for example, or like organizations like CoLab that focused on early stage ideas and developing the, developing them into actual businesses. Uh, there's a myriad and plethora of organizations and missions that are dedicated towards helping people take their passions and their obsessions and turn it into their professions, so to speak. So I focus on entrepreneurship centers and early stage idea of programming. Mm-hmm. And there's yeah. numerous of them. And the especially staff. here in Memphis uh, for the last few years, there are plenty of programs, especially the Startco and yeah. the Epicenter. Yeah. I think yeah. it's just amazing that uh, they're doing a Merge. great job. And uh, yeah, emerge and on top of it, now we are in a virtual world and there are plenty of meetup groups and community building uh, that are really wanting to help entrepreneurs because a lot of people are really struggling during this time, yeah. are losing jobs and trying to kickstart something. And we are in a great community. And I think irrespective of where you are, who are listening, and I think uh, getting started is the most difficult thing. But once you get started and if you have, and I think one insight that I also got because it is going to be more uh, lonely, identify those key people around you who are equally passionate about solving that problem because that can give a lot of energy as well. That's what happened in my case as well. If you have the friends or people who are going to believe in you and really support you throughout your journey, make them your partner. And I think that's a, that's a great thing because you can support one another to be able to like drive off of each other ideas and also push forward because it's very challenging if you're just one person who is trying to um, drive the strategy and trying to identify the customers to talk to always have more than one person. And one of the programs that myself and Ryan went to Delta iPhone program. And what was that experience like you going through that customer discovery phase? Uh, I mean, I personally love customer discovery and talking to people. And I think uh, you, you do the same as well. So, what was that experience identifying the true pain points of customer and how can listeners can do that? So for those who don't know, just to provide a bit of context, the Delta I Fund is an early stage um, accelerated program that focus on, that's focused on validating your assumptions through customer discovery. It's a customer discovery based accelerated program for ideas and businesses. Um, I entered that in, 20, in the spring of 2019 and it was an incredible experience. I'll say to sum it up, it 
grew me into a true entrepreneur. It really grew hairs on my chest because um, I was forced to be vulnerable, hmm. <laughs> to uh, really take my baby, my idea, and open it up to the world and truly receive feedback, good or bad. And I had to, I had to accept it either way. Uh, we conducted maybe, I think, around 70 interviews, around 70 interviews while in the, while in the program. We talked to numerous um, HVAC technicians, multiple wholesale you know, supply companies, um, numerous HVAC companies. Um, and we found, we found um, a true company. <laughs> we found our business through customer discovery. And talking to the people that we were hoping to sell our product to, they, through data and through their responses, literally crafted the solution that they wanted to see. It was scary at the beginning. It was exhilarating in the middle. And it was um, truly um, hopeful towards the end because I knew that I had a product that was validated. And I knew that I, knew I had a product that customers were gonna wanna buy because I took the time to do it. And much like starting your company, when you're doing customer discovery, the hardest thing is just stopping, starting, excuse me, uh, and getting it going. But it was a great experience. Um, heard a whole lot of no's. I heard a lot of no's. I heard a whole lot of, I don't see it, that's not gonna work. But I heard even more, I love it. I heard a lot more, maybe you should do this and tweak it like this, that developed Compass into the platform that we had uh, hoped and designed for it to be. Wow, and on top of it, you went through several uh, pitch competitions as a student as well. Like that yes. was something that I really enjoyed uh, being, uh, being a student and going to a lot of pitch competitions and getting that early feedback from investors, mentors, from like you get to see other students who are pitching, who are going through the same journey. And what was that experience like you uh, that really helped you to shape where you are today? Had it not been for programming, like the Delta I Fund or Imagine You or pitch competitions, I don't think myself and my team would have had the energy to keep on going. I think programming, I think opportunities like that are so crucial to entrepreneurs in the early stage because what you're doing when you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're trying to make a dream or an idea tangible. You're trying to grasp for something real. That's really what you're trying to do. And in even going through a pitch competition, something as simple as being able to craft a pitch deck, write a script, practice it, get enthused, uh, you know, get theatrical with it, get hyped up and energized and express that passion and energy to a panel of experienced people that have done what you're trying to do before. Something as simple as that can really mean so much for your confidence when you're trying to forge onward with your journey. You know, like not even in winning a competition, but in competing and doing your best and in receiving good feedback. It's those, it's those words of affirmation. It's that confidence. It's those tweaks. It's those ideas that people can really plug inside of your brain to, um, that can spur you and be a catalyst for you to keep on driving forward. That makes the journey all worthwhile. It's really a game of riding highs and living through lows when you're an entrepreneur. And when you're doing those programs and living through those, uh, or competing in those pitch competitions, man, it's a great way for you to like really build your confidence, learn much more about your field, your industry, as well as the entrepreneurial ecosystem, and find that fire. You need fire, you need passion. You also need obsession, but you need fire to attack it with ferocity. Because if you don't have that, you're not gonna push through. And those competitions really serve to light that fire, so. I mean, I'm sure you can even hear it in my voice. I'm getting just like revved up talking about it. Um, I love pitch competitions. I do. It doesn't even matter if you win. Although we play to win, it's, uh, it's more important just to get in the arena, you know, and, and they say iron sharpens iron, you know. So that's, I love it. And I think any entrepreneur should do it. It's great that you also mentioned that you doesn't have to be the winner. And in fact, like I could definitely say that yes, because just going through that process of just listening from other entrepreneurs who are at the same stage where you are and how they have pivoted their ideas and how they are getting the feedback and listening to the whole experience. And I think that really helped me as well. Personally, when I started my journey as a, as a student entrepreneur a few years ago, and that really helped me uh, to really, and sometimes like, you no, know, I won some competitions, which really pushed me even harder. Hey, like, you, know, you can do it. And this makes sense. And, this is the feedback that I got. And I think that really boosted my confidence too. And I really encourage all the students. And I think sometimes to, to tell like every student should actually go through this and just like, you know, express their ideas because that is the place. It's a perfect place for you to get that confidence. 
because all you have to do is look up where these competitions are happening and just apply with your idea. And I think sometimes every who doesn't have an idea, right? Yeah. Everybody has ideas because ideas are free, right? So I think uh, that's just amazing that how these competitions, I mean, a lot of companies that came out of colleges are actually who went through this process. And yeah, they, they started in the three day startup or they started at a, you know, start code pitch day, demo day competition or something. So much happens at, the, at events like those. And it, I was just looking at my first business model a couple of days back and it was like, I was just laughing at it because like, wow, like I, I couldn't imagine how we changed it over the past years now. We have been iterating and pivoting and doing customer discovery and constant updation of your business model and understanding what's the real pain point for the customer, which is super critical for early stage startups to prove. Because sometimes customers don't know what they want to. And yeah. on top of it, like what was your experience? Any, any examples that you felt like, hey, sometimes customers are really trying to, I mean, customers don't know what they want. And sometimes it is, it is uh, we who are trying to show them uh, what, what we are building and how they, it can solve the problem. There's so much that I can say about that, <laughs> especially coming from the, the, the vantage point of a startup that was focused on a, a service like HVAC or like plumbing or like electrical work, right? When you're creating a startup that is tailored towards creating a more efficient process for more antiquated uh, legacy type businesses that have been in family histories for, for, for generations, um, processes are passed down, right? And when you're creating a startup, you're essentially creating a way to make something more efficient in one way or another, or solve a problem generally that equates to efficiency or creating opportunity, something like that, or what have you. Um, but, you know, I talk to a lot of startups or a lot of companies like HVAC companies or wholesalers that when presented with our idea um, said, yeah, we see, we see value in that, but I, I don't see myself using it. We just like doing things this way, you know? I, I had, I've talked to business owners and I won't say like which companies or whatever, where I went into their, wholesale, their, their wholesale store or the HVAC company, uh, pitched the idea, wanted to get their feedback. And they told me, no, yeah, I mean, now that you've mentioned it, we're not very efficient when it comes to dispatching drivers. We're not very efficient when it comes to how we order parts or distribute parts, but we like doing it this way. Now, granted from one business owner to to another timing uh is very crucial for a startup and it may be one of the most crucial things along with your obsession and your drive hearkening back to that word of serendipitous you know the timing can really mean everything and um along with that there are many companies or startups that may be doing customer discovery or pitching their idea to to potential customers and they may not see a need in it but the keyword is yet along with that and that's why you have to keep on pushing forward so yeah being inside of the hvac field we felt that from the very beginning <laughs> we felt that from the very beginning um not feeling like our customers truly knew what they wanted or they were okay with utilizing a traditional inefficient process hmm. you know that's just you just mentioned like what are the existing tools that they're already currently using uh, I think sometimes uh, they just get used to the same process that they don't want to change yeah. uh, then to the new process. That's just amazing uh, uh, key insight, Ryan. Right? And what is the one thing that you wanted our listeners to take away from our, uh, from our show today? And like, you know, for any entrepreneurs or students who are listening to your story and your journey as a student entrepreneur, what would you tell them? I would tell anyone who's looking to start a business that you need to have passion about what you're doing. If you're not creating a better world for other people through your startup, I, you're not gonna make it. You're not gonna make it. You need to be driven by something larger and greater than yourself. Essentially, you are effectively creating a movement. And if you yourself don't believe it, you can't expect for others to believe it as well. So be led by your passions. Understand this entrepreneurial journey is very much a process. And if you have patience with it, and are obsessed with solving a problem and being led by that, that passion, that fire, it'll all work out. Vinky is a classic example, you know, and even if your startup doesn't work out, this going down a pathway like this opens you up to a myriad of different incredible opportunities. 
and you build skill sets and create a mindset for yourself that can be applied to numerous opportunities. So I would encourage anyone interested to simply just start today. Why not now? Be led by your passions and be guided by a larger purpose. That's what I'm That's just amazing. You are truly driven by doing a Ryan, and uh, you are one of those uh, students that I always look up to uh, for other students to like really uh, take your journey and your story uh, so that making them believe that they can do it too is a, is a, is a great thing. And you are truly driven by doing and helping like a lot of student entrepreneurs and alumni at the University of Memphis to really bring their dreams uh, come true. And uh, keep doing what that. you're doing. Yeah. I just go. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for being on the show today. And uh, all the very best for all the projects that you're working on. And uh, thank you so much again. Thanks so much, Becky. Had a great time.